Hello everyone and welcome to my channel, The Labo de G. This is the second part of my series devoted to HDR. Today I have plenty of things to tell you about again. We are going to look about the different standards, the different formats, we'll talk about the famous metadata, and we'll talk about the EOTF curve. Still a lot of things to look at together, but first, jingle intro. Welcome to the second part and we are going to talk about the HDR, short for High Dynamic Range, as opposition to the SDR, short for the Standard Dynamic Range. What does an HDR signal can offer to you? A larger dynamic range, more information in high and low lights, an encoding in 10 bits to say goodbye to bending problems. The HDR also allows a frame rate higher than before. Before we had 24 or 25 images per second. Today it can display 48, 60 or even 120 images per second. This is called high frame rate. We are about to debunk certain misconceptions. First, HDR is not an effect you patch in post-production. HDR is not related to the size of a picture. And HDR doesn't boost colors. HDR is like a palette you gave to an artist. But this palette is way bigger than the one we used to have for SD content. When I tell you that HDR is not related to the size of pictures, it's because today people sell you 4K HDR content because HDR and the 4K were released at the same time on the consumer market. But we can totally do HDR content in 1080p or HDR content in 8K, 16K, 32K. In short, HDR is not related to the size of the image. Each color is standardized. It has precise values. No matter the streamer you're watching, the color has to be the same. If not, it's because your display system is poorly adjusted. A red in HDR would be the same in SDR. There's no reason for your red in SDR to become fuchsia in HDR. When a movie is remastered in 4K HDR, the remastering will go through a rescan of the film. We will have more information because we are going to have a master 4K with more sharpness. The HDR color palette is larger than what we had in SDR. But there is no reason for the color to change. It would be less blurry, more precise for sure. We may have a better control of the saturation. Also, we will have more information in high and low lights. But if from a version to another one, the colors change, it's only due to the artistic intention of the director or the colorist, and they would apply different values. The color doesn't change by the might of the Holy Spirit, and the HDR doesn't boost the color. Today there are six standards of HDR. HLG, HDR10, HDR10+, Eclair Color, Technicolor SLHDR1 and 2, and Dolby Vision. Each of these standards has a characterized curve which is a very specific EOTF curve. HLG and SLHDR3 are based on HLG curve. HDR10, HDR10 plus Dolby Vision and SLHDR are based on PQ curve. Eclair Color and SLHDR1 are based on Gamma curve. We are going to talk about HLG developed by BBC and NHK. It mainly concerns live content, sport events, music events and globally everything broadcasted on TV. The curve is very specific because it's a curve called Hybrid Log Gamma, or HLG. From 0 to 100 nits, it's gonna act like a Rec 709 curve, a Gamma curve. And from 100 to 5000 nits, it's gonna act like a logarithmic curve. The signal is encoded in 10 bits, and there is no bitrate increase. To simplify, the HLG allows you to display an HDR content encapsulated in an SDR content. It's a backward compatible signal. We are able to broadcast an HLG on a non-HDR TV set. The signal is transmitted by satellite. BBC and NHK didn't want to take any risk of associating a metadata that can be lost on its way, and risk that the signal possibly being poorly decoded at her home. Now we are going to talk about the PQ curve, stands for Perceptual Contrasizer. It was standardized by SMPTE under the name of ST2084. This curve was developed by the Dolby Laboratory. They were not alone, there are a lot of other labs that were associated to this, and they rebuy a lot of patents. But globally, the PQ is derived from Dolby's lab. Dolby performs a lot of experiments. They broadcast a signal on a display set that went from 0 to 100 nits, 
to 10,000 nits and from 0 to 20,000 nits. They noticed that the most agreeable picture to watch was located between 0 and 10,000 nits. They developed a curved base on the human's vision and it's able to associate all radios from 0 to 10,000 nits correspondent value in bits. It's an absolute curve. Overall, the metadata is the file table of contents. It will contain all the information that was created during the masterization and will allow the display device to display the content. There are two types of metadata, the statics and the dynamics. The statics means that you have only one series of information to characterize the whole content. HDR10 uses static metadata. Dolby Vision, HDR10+, and SLHDR are using dynamic metadata which means that there is one series of information by scene. Each scene will have its own series of information. What is inside the metadata? There are a lot of things. There is the size of the image, the color space, the sampling, the color depth, the bitrate, the used codex, the HDR characterization, the type of metadata used, the frame rate, the pixel ratio, the used EOTF curve, the color primaries, the color range, the mastering display luminance, as you can see, that's a lot of information. But mainly, there are two extremely important values. The max full and the max CLL. The max full is the maximum frame average light level, or the average level of luminance of the image. The max CLL is the maximum content light level, the level of the brightest pixel of the image. From these two values, the content is characterized. Depending on if you have a static or a dynamic metadata, it's gonna change everything. Mainly if your display device is not able to display light level as bright as the peak of your content. I'm gonna try to explain this simply. When you have a content on the Blu-ray, most of the time the light peak is at 1000 nits. Or 4000 nits sometimes, but let's take 1000 nits. If you use a QLED, you'll have less problems. Because your QLED is usually able to display 1000 nits. It can be 1000, 1500, or even 2000 or more for the most sophisticated ones. For the black, it's more complicated on the QLED. But that's not the point here. On the other hand, what happens if you have an OLED which can only display 600 nits maximum? It means that technically it cannot display 1000 nits. It will do what we call tone mapping and roll off. It will take the highest value and reduce them to the capacity of your display system. So if it can only display 600 nits, so the 1000 nits will be reduced to 600. But by doing that, all the content will be reduced. The image will be darker. If necessary, the color volume will change too, because when the luminance is changing, it's also changing the chrominance. Your content will be transformed. When you have static metadata, you have only one reference for all the content. But if this content is analyzed with only this information, in a movie, the scenes are more or less bright. And none of the scenes will have the same light intensity or the same value of lighting. So the content will be adapted according to only one characteristic. So obviously, it won't be shown in the most realistic way. So it has been interpreted the tone mapping is done with these values. But if you have dynamic metadata, you will have dynamic tone mapping. That means that there will be scenes where the content will be reduced, some other less, and so on. It will adapt scene by scene, and the output will be more precise if you use dynamic metadata. Every display device use different algorithms to do the tone mapping, which means that from a device to another, the signal is not treated the same way. Some will do a better job in the control of highlight, some will burn the highlight, some will reduce the whole image. Unfortunately, there are as many treatments as there are different processors. Concretely, it means that an HDR10 image with static metadata, if you use it on three different HDR10 TV sets, there is a big chance that you will obtain three totally different images. Let's not be fooled. The bigger the gap between the light peak on the master and what your device can display, the more the tone mapping will be strong and the more the image will get transformed. Of course, it depends on the quality of your display device and on the quality of the tone mapping. 
I don't be foolish between a TV that you paid $500 and a TV that you paid $4,000, the tone mapping won't be the same. The tone mapping has a role of concerns the luminance, but also the chromacity and the skin tones. The tone mapping is what allows you to take the Blu-ray content in P3 and display it in Rec 2020 on your TV set. And similarly, allow your device to display BT2020. But look at the characteristics. Some of them only display 90% of the BT2020, some of them are only 70, or even 85%. The tone mapping is done according to the characteristic of your device. All the content that uses dynamic metadata, like HDR10+, Dolby Vision and SLHDR, they also use static metadata, which means that the Dolby Vision content, if it's displayed on a TV set that is not compatible with Dolby Vision but compatible with HDR, will be changed itself in HDR10. And same for HDR10+, content. If it's displayed on a non-compatible HDR10+, device, only HDR10, it will convert itself to HDR10. There is always static metadata, even with content using dynamic ones. The metadata is presented in the form of a text file, an XML file. For the static metadata, they are in the header of the file. For the dynamic ones, all the content you may find on Netflix, Amazon Prime or Apple TV, the metadata is interlaced directly into the file. For Dolby Vision, it matches as a profile file. On the other hand, for the Blu-ray, the physical medium, the metadata is synchronized with the video track. It's another layer on the top of the video. A small trick for those of you who digitize your collection, when you take the Blu-ray and make a digital file to store it on your hard drive or your server, when you do that, when you make a MKV file, you're losing the dynamic metadata. Why? Because the metadata is not coded into the HEVC H265. It's an XML file, it's above it. The only way to keep dynamic metadata is to burn the totality of the Blu-ray to make an easel file. Like this, you will have the Dolby Vision and the HDR10+. But only if you have a device able to read an ISO file and compatible with Dolby Vision or HDR10+. I will pass very quickly over the HLG because I already talked about it with the OETF curve, the HLG is the HDR standard for broadcasting. It concerns mainly broadcasted content, TV shows and sport events. This signal is retro-compatible with HDR. A HDR TV is not necessary to enjoy it. We're going to talk about SLHDR. It was developed by Technicolor, but not only. There is Philips, Cable Labs and Microelectronics that are beyond the project. But Technicolor is in charge now. There are three types of SLHDR. SLHDR1, which is a SDR content with information to reconstruct a HDR signal. Which means that if you send this signal onto a SDR TV set, you will have SDR content. If you send it on the HDR TV set, the SDR is able to rebuild the HDR signal from the information encapsulated in the signal. There is SLHDR2. It's a pure HDR turn signal associated with dynamic metadata. It's an HDR signal made to be displayed on a HDR TV set. And finally, there is SLHDR3, based on the HLG content associated with metadata. This signal is still in development. Let's talk about Eclair Color. Cocorico is French. It mainly concerns broadcasting systems for cinemas. Eclair Color is an HDR signal, but for film screening. With an Eclair Color display system, you can have a light peak at 103 nits. A standard cinema is at 48 nits. Eclair Color offers a set of services to improve the screening conditions. They are labeling some projectors, they are studying and offering solutions to improve the level of reflection in the room. So there will be less light pollution. They are also offering content calibrated according to the Eclair Color standard. All of that will give you a way more optimal experience than what you can have in standard cinema theater. They also established a workflow to remaster all content. And finally, Eclair Color signed a contract with Samsung Company in order to integrate their technology in theater using the LED cinema screen Onyx. These screens are almost able to display absolute black and a light peak reaching 300 nits. Let's focus on HDR10, HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision because they are the standards you have for most of your content at home. HDR10 is the standard HDR. No matter the equipment you are going to buy, low-cost or premium, it will be able to display HDR10. It's the open source for HDR. 
so the manufacturers don't need to pay royalties to integrate HDR10 technology. It's based on PQ curve encoded in 10 bits. It can display a light intensity from 0 to 10,000 nits. As we saw before, HDR10 is using static metadata, which means you only have one piece of information to characterize the whole content. HDR10 Plus has the same characteristics as HDR10, but it's using dynamic metadata instead of static one. It was developed by Samsung with the help of Panasonic, Warner Bros, 20th Century Fox, and Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime is the place where you can find the most HDR10 Plus content. Regarding the physical medium, contents that offer HDR10 Plus are not common today. Maybe around 20, 30 Blu-rays. Now we are going to talk about Dolby Vision and we are going to take some time because there are a lot of things to say. Dolby Vision is based on the HDR10 content associated with dynamic metadata. Dolby Vision content is made with very precise specifications. First of all, any Dolby Vision content is meant from a content encoded at 12 bit at least. Dolby Vision content is masterized on the standardized monitors who also respect precise specifications. They can display at least 1000 nits, they have to recognize 100% of the DCI-P3 space, they have to display BT2020 and the EOTF curve ST2084. Dolby recommends several types of monitor. The Rolls Royce was Dolby Pulsar, which can display 4000 nits, out of stock now. There are other brands like Sony, Canon and Flanders Scientific. Once the color grading is finished, there is a process called shot analysis. Basically, all the shots will be displayed and the SDR version will be made. Dolby offers a unit called the Content Mapping Unit, the CMU, and the CMU is able to display the signal on the HDR screen and at the same time, convert the signal into SDR for a SDR screen. Dolby proposes tool with the CMU to make SDR content match the HDR content as much as possible. During the signal mastering, the metadata is created. The metadata contains a lot of information. But more precisely, there is a different level of information in Dolby's metadata. Dolby Vision offers you trims, which means that from the final color grading, it's gonna make a tone mapping. This tone mapping is making a trim at 2000 nits, a trim at 600 nits, and even a trim in SDR. From the same color grading, it will provide reference to the metadata, different versions adapted to each display device. The signal is encoded, it's sent to your Dolby Vision TV. And your Dolby Vision TV set contains a Dolby Vision CMU, which recognizes the metadata and interpret and displays the signal. The original signal in 12 bits 444, the metadata has been created from that. The values and the information about the colors have been made from that. And you can find this information in the metadata. The metadata is analyzed by the CMU in your TV set at home, and from the 42010 bit delivery that you have on your Blu-ray, Netflix, Amazon Prime, or whatever, the CMU on your TV Dolby Vision will recognize the metadata and detect that the signal was at first in 444 and 12 bits. It will recognize the color information associated and it will display on your device a signal equivalent to 444 12 bits. Dolby Vision decoding is extremely precise. The CMU will restore the signal in the most accurate way and it will deactivate everything unbeneficial to your TV. Everything that could drain the signal in order to restore what was created and approved in the color grading room. It's the magic of Dolby Vision. If you want to see your image in the most accurate way, you have to calibrate your TV set. The calibration process happens this way. Someone comes to your place with some tools a spectrometer and a colorimeter. He will send a signal to your TV, a red, green, blue and white, and his image is analyzed by the spectrometer and the colorimeter. To put it simply, the red that's sent to your TV must match some broadcasting standards. If the values measured by the probe don't match the broadcasting standards, you need to recalibrate your TV. It means that the color deviated and that your calibration deviated. To do so, the values are analyzed and sent to a software program with which recalibrate and create one delet or three delet file. The file is sent to your TV and recalibrate it this way. This is what happens in the best situation when your TV is able to be calibrated. 
If not, you have to calibrate it with the television remote and menu while you're measuring with the probe. In a simpler way, it's like the software was creating a mini EOTF curve to redisplay color properly. That's it for today. Once again, I was very talkative, I told you a lot of things. I hope your brain is not steaming, and we'll meet again very soon for the third part. Our hands will get a little dirty, we'll dissect some contents, we'll analyze some pictures, some Blu-ray, some footage I recorded, and it's gonna be fascinating. But until then, take care of yourself and see you soon. One last gift, here is a repartition of the different HDR formats, according to the country, the brand, the partner studio, and the streamers. I will let you pause the video because, as you can see, it's not that simple.